Hi everyone, welcome to season two of Coffee with Dr. A. I'm excited about the next season and all that I have lined up for you. Conversations about economics, teaching online, and financial literacy. Season one was a success and that was because of you, so thank you. Today on Coffee with Dr. A, we're talking to Dr. Rebecca Morrow from Emmanuel College in Boston. She's an innovative economic educator and a Fulbright scholar. I'm excited to talk to her today. We will talk about her non-traditional path to where she is today, her use of social media and podcasts to teach economics, and actually a resource that she has created for all educators, and how she ended up in Rwanda for a year. If you are new here, my name is Dr. Abdullah Albarani, or I go by Dr. A. And on this channel, we talk about economics and financial literacy. I am a big believer that everyone can benefit from a strong foundation of economics, and on this channel, I create videos to make economics easier to understand. So grab a cup of coffee and enjoy this conversation. Make sure to use the chat function to ask any questions and to build community. So thank you for being here. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here today. I know it's the end of the semester. I'm not sure exactly when this episode is going to air, but it'll probably be a couple of weeks from from now. So by then, we would be past the, the end of the semester, but I understand how stressful uh, the end of the semester is for students, faculty, so I really, really appreciate you being here. Um, I have a question for you. I, I take this for granted. I assume everybody drinks coffee. Are you a coffee drinker? I am a coffee drinker, and I have my my coffee mug here, Colleges of the Fenway. We'll talk more about that. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, well, I appreciate you joining me on Coffee with Dr. A. Um, the, the goal of today is, you know, just to get to know you better. We've, you know, co-authored, we've written an op-ed together, uh, which I'm pretty excited about. And um, we've worked and connect through social media. One thing that I like to give uh, the opportunity to my guests here is to tell the world what the world should know about them. So uh, this is could be your academic background, anything that you think the, uh, the, the audience should know about uh, Dr. Rebecca Morrow. Okay, well, it is a big question, but I guess in the context we're talking about, I think it's true for most of the people you're talking to. Um, I'm an economics educator. That's one of the things that I'm passionate about professionally. Um, I would say um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about how that happened, but I think for me, a big part of my path to that uh, position informs the way that I approach it and, and why I care about it and how I do it. So for me, um, I think it's the idea of exposing and introducing as many students as possible to economics and the way that it can help them to understand the world uh, regardless of their path. Um, and so that has to do, I think, somewhat with, with my path to economics. Uh, but I would say I'm very passionate about effective and engaging economics instruction and uh, trying to integrate that into other aspects of my life through travel. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, I think, think that's, that's pretty much what is most relevant for today. All right. So, so when you, uh, you know, it's, we've had uh, two econom uh, economics educators uh, on recently. And it's a, it's a common theme because I think there's a lot of amazing things happening in economic education. And you are part of uh, that group of faculty that are innovating. Uh, so before we get to the innovations in economic education, what was your career path? How did you end up at Emmanuel College? You just mentioned that you, you had a non-traditional path. Um, what was it? So I came to Economics, I think, in a, in a not super roundabout way, except if you're going to end up as a, a professor of economics. So my uh, bachelor's degree is from Trinity College in Hartford in public policy. Um, so I'm very interested in the ways that society tries to, you know, provide supports and opportunities uh, and to make uh, meet societal goals. And so for me, uh, learning that economics was a tool for understanding that and a framework for understanding that as well as for creating potential solutions was really exciting. 
I didn't stumble on that until a little bit later in my undergrad uh, career. So I went on and got a master's in economic policy. So it was applied master's, again, focusing on how do we use economics to understand and to try to address policy issues. I started teaching while I was doing that. That was at Suffolk University. That's how those things sort of came together. Um, my family is all teachers, so it's not that surprising. It wasn't where I thought I was going, but it's not a surprise that I ended up there. Um, and then as I was working after that, I was doing um, consulting uh, for nonprofits and um, also, you know, doing the teaching. I decided that in order to be more effective in both areas um, and because I like learning, I'm passionate about education, I wanted to get my PhD. And so for that, I circled back to public policy with a focus on economics. So I'm kind of a, a Venn diagram of these two issues. And so when I pursued the uh, PhD in public policy at UMass Boston, um, it was again to try to develop the tools that I was interested in for pursuing policy areas, potentially for consulting, as well as um, getting the credentials for, for both teaching and uh, for consulting. And then Boston is a college town famously, so I was yeah. you know, doing a lot of adjuncting, trying out different uh, institutions, different um, frameworks for economics, and I uh, ended up at Emanuel College as one of the places I was working, and it was a really good fit from both sides. So we kind of came to an opportunity came up uh, for the in the department there of business and economics. And that's how I ended up uh, with a full time academic job, right. So my career path is not one that you would prescribe for somebody who wanted to end up doing what I'm doing. But hopefully that's inspiration if that's what you want to do. And, and hopefully, um, you know, if your life is long, and you keep doors open, you can try all kinds of different things. So. And, and you know that's that's something that I've uh, recently found is how many of my colleagues and friends have a path to to economics or what they're doing that is would be considered non-traditional and we all assume that there's you know a, a traditional path but it seems like the the common theme is non-traditional is the way to go um, so I'm really interested in Emmanuel College so uh, Emmanuel College is a small liberal arts college that's in Boston. It was founded in 1919, so we had an anniversary last year. Um, it's about 2,000 students. Um, it, Boston is a college town. What makes Emmanuel unique there is uh, both the liberal arts context. Uh, physically, it's, it's uh, really a traditional, beautiful campus, you know, with a, with a communal green, and it's really contiguous, which is unusual in Boston. As far as the students, um, Emmanuel has a social justice tradition, so it's very engaged in the community and students are very interested in solving problems in a, in a broader sense. So, you know, curious about society, curious about themselves, um, very engaged. So about, I think, 80% of students do are engaged in community service throughout their time at Emmanuel. 100% do internships, which again, Boston is a great place to do that. Uh, we're located right in the heart of the uh, Longwood Medical Center, which is right now a really interesting place to be with the Harvard School of Public Health as neighbors. And we're also part of the, this is my little mug, uh, Colleges <laughs> of the Fenway. So it's actually a group of uh, colleges that are all affiliated. So you can take courses and there's inter, um, inter kind of university majors and minors as well at Simmons at Wentworth Institute of Technology and Mass College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences, as well as Mass Art. So all of these different organizations that are, you know, uh, niche and specific, but it makes for interesting classrooms. So I have a student uh, next semester who's coming to take micro with me from Wentworth. Um, actually, no, I'm sorry, they're going to take urban economics because they're focusing on um, real estate development as their major. So it's a great to get samples of all kinds of different students in the classroom. It, it sounds like an amazing place with a, with a lot of diversity and uh, different backgrounds. And your personal background and applications to public policy lends really well in this, uh, in this environment. Um, I'm sure, do you get to advise students one-on-one -on, -one on theses? Is this something that happens there? Yeah, so we, uh, the graduate component of Emmanuel's is much smaller. It's in the, there's uh, programs in nursing and programs in um, 
uh, MBA, so I don't do so much advising at a manual on that area, but we have been able to create a concentration in economic policy. That's something, again, with the social justice component and my experience and a number of other instructors, uh, it's something that students get very interested in. So they want economics, again, as a tool. Uh, it overlaps as well. We have an international policy concentration. Again, it's something that students are curious about understanding how they can see the world this way. So that's all been terrific. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I follow you on uh, Instagram. And by the way, uh, highly recommended if you're watching this, uh, Prof Moral, correct? Um, it, and, uh, you know, you share a lot of valuable information. And but most importantly, I get to see how you engage with your students on that platform. And uh, recently I came across one of your posts that talked about your class microeconomics for policy. Can you tell me what exactly you do in that class and what was the project that you were um, promoting? Right. So that was actually unusual. So this semester I um, got recruited in to teach in the program that I got my Ph.D. from. So that course is actually for that program. So it's been wonderful okay. for me to go back. Like you said, policy is really my interest. So this is kind of where I get to go, as you were mentioning a minute ago, to focus on the policy piece. So uh, the course is like the introductory kind of econ uh, level course for those students who are focusing largely on public policy, uh, but it can also be a bit more diverse. So this semester I have students who are interested in health policy, specifically some of them gerontology. I have students that are looking at uh, urban policy. So it's really, again, that idea of how do you come to understand econ as a tool for what you want to do and exploring that framework more intensively than they might have before that. So that has been really fun for me. Uh, the, t the instructor that usually teaches it is on sabbatical, so I got a little uh, bonus there. It's an interesting and challenging course. Um, yeah, so it's, that's been really fun. So, so the project I think that I um, remember uh, hearing about is PSAs. Yeah, so uh, for that class, one of the texts is the Thaler Sunstein Nudge. And okay. so we were reading that. And again, because the students come from so many different areas of policy, you know, as, you're, as we're um, both reading journal articles and having discussions, to try to reach everyone's area of interest is, is a bit of a challenge. So I thought it would be interesting to try to use the behavioral economics in Nudge to develop a public service announcement for their area of interest. And so it was all kinds of things. Some of it was relevant to their specific policy. Others were just what students were interested in. So there was quite a few around COVID because I think we all get the idea that communications could be a little bit better in that area. Um, but there was also, you know, about um, preventing drowning. So it was a lot about leveraging the idea about, you know, law of small numbers and how we approach information and how you frame. So it was it was a good and creative opportunity to apply those ideas in a way that you might in some future in some future position as well. So yeah, very you know these project based uh, learning uh, environments uh, something that I gravitate towards. I find my students actually uh, enjoy the subject more when they get you know experiential or long period uh, project. So, you know, I, I've done the econ beats in the past. Uh, we talk about econ selfies. We have a paper together about that. Um, but those are items that I think the traditional economics classroom marginalizes uh, those experiences. But from my experience, students actually learn a lot. Um, what, what are your thoughts on these project based learning uh, opportunities? I agree. I, again, where I'm, especially in intro type classes, so I'm, I guess maybe, again, we keep saying this idea of non-traditional, but maybe that's all a, a <laughs> false reality we've created for ourselves as well. But I, I love teaching the intro uh, micro, for instance. Uh, I get a lot of students, the majority are not econ students, and I know that, and I am ha like happy to have them. And I think the more that you can provide opportunities you know, it's cliche, but to connect the classroom to their lives and to give students some freedom to do that. But like you said, over the longer term projects as well. So they're getting feedback as you know, so about how that's going and, and kind of sharpening their economic lens, right? So 
especially from a liberal arts context, the idea is that there's lots of different ways to see the world. And economics is an important one, and it can be you know, used to magnify and understand and analyze all kinds of aspects of the world. So what about the world are you interested in or curious about, or can you, you know, feign curiosity about even for a number of weeks? So doing that practical application, I think, is where, to me, it becomes useful. Even if you're never going to take econ again, if you don't make those applications, then you can still walk out thinking that, okay, either I survived that or it was interesting. But if you're really not making the connection of relevance, then I feel like you're missing a huge huge opportunity. So I know you still do some econ selfies kind of stuff. What other projects are you doing in that area? So this semester, uh, my, my challenge has been more about how do we, how do I build those relationships that I did in person in an online environment? And, you know, there's been a lot of debate, a lot of discussion about how impossible it is to replicate in-person education and i agree in-person education cannot be replicated and that should not be the goal uh, but online education has actually provided me more opportunities to engage students in conversations uh, because the boundaries of the conversation don't end with classroom environment so the use of discussion boards is something that um, and and continuing the conversation on the discussion board throughout the semester is uh, something that I've utilized uh, this semester, and I'm going to keep. Um, it's one of those things that will remain forever, uh, because I I got to see how students' thought processes uh, grew with the content, but most importantly, their language, right? So we always talk about how economics is learning a new language, mm -hmm. and uh, watching how their structure of sentences evolved with the feedback and uh, you know with more information, is. Um, it's really rewarding from a perspective, from an instructor perspective. Um, so, uh, econ selfie this semester was my last, um, close to the last assignment. The and and what I wanted them there to do there is kind of use it as a review. So, pick your favorite topic that we covered this semester and take a picture that might represent, um, you know, that concept and explain to me why it represents that concept and, um, you know. Uh, I'll make sure to link to our paper about econ selfies. Uh, this is a good place to, to do that. Uh, but what I noticed this semester is because students were comfortable writing discussion boards throughout the semester, it was much easier for them to express themselves um, than, than in the past. It sort of builds so, that scaffolding piece in a little bit, yeah. Exactly. You, you mentioned the idea of using it for review. That's something I do as well. The, Again, in, in intro, I have the students create uh, their original podcasts. Yeah. It's usually a group activity. This time I didn't because I wasn't sure about the online logistics of that. I think I'm gonna give students an offer option to do that in the spring, so that'll be my experiment for the spring. Um, but I also build that in where they do it twice during the semester. One is more like a, a library of terms. So you're assigned a term and you have to define it and apply it to the world a, a couple of ways. And then students do peer review of that right before the midterm. So it's a great way to review concepts, but they also have to be critical of it. Is that the best application? Does that make sense, what the student has done? And then yeah. at the end of the semester where they're creating more of like a story-based podcast, again, they listen to one another's before the exam, and then that can become really useful for tying in concepts and thinking again about that application to the world. So I think thinking about how the students can not only benefit from doing it, but from giving each other feedback and then from structuring it into the semester, I think is, uh, can be good when it finally all comes together. Yeah, no, that's, you know, that's really valuable. How to, how to get students to, um, know that they retained information. You know, that's, uh, I, I think if anybody follows me on social media, they've seen my, uh, hot takes on this, uh, online versus in-person uh, uh, debate that's going on. One of the things that I think we need to do better as instructors in higher education is battle this um, myth or misconception that online education is not as good as in-person education, that students are getting cheated out of the, the education. My experience hasn't been the case, but you know that's just one, one data point. Um, but there's ways for us and you know here I want to talk about the way you use Instagram to show the world what your students are learning and for your students to show 
others what they're learning because to me that's what they walk away then saying oh shoot yeah i did learn something right well i think when you were talking about um uh the idea of getting feedback and also the idea of students understanding how you see economics in the world that's how my uh use of instagram sort of started is that idea of demonstrating for students you know like you said in the face-to-face -face classroom you've got that you know three hours a week or whatever and it feel it felt closed and so both is a way to help students to see the way that you see the world but also in a way it ended up being useful to reach those students that are actually the, the students that are doing better or are more curious um, because you know you in class you might say oh you could read this or you know you could touch on this article but it's different I think to open that up and have it all the time. I saw this article, this is what I thought, what's your experience? Or um, I'm doing this other thing, right? So again, that idea of you're a whole person and understanding as well what, what it is to be a, uh, an academic. So you're sharing with them the other work that you're doing and that you're you know thinking about the classes and you're introducing new ideas. So it's about, I think, opening up a lot outside of that envelope of those three hours and I think it just makes it a lot easier for students to interact with you as well kind of jumping topics but you were mentioning the idea about like the discussion boards working better online I also think in some ways students found it easier to come to office hours I don't know if this was your experience but a number of students and we talked about it afterwards and, and I understand like walking into a professor's office with all the books behind them and also like I'm you know I tend to be very focused and so a student comes in and as much as I, I'm there and I want to have that conversation, sometimes I'm sure that read, they read the look in your eye like, oh, I was in the middle of something else. Yeah. Just because I, I'm a multitasking person. But I think in this dynamic, it's much easier in a way. They, they, the, the barrier isn't there. You don't have to physically walk. You don't have to enter someone else's space. You're in your safe space. I don't know, what was your experience with that? E yeah, I mean, you you explained it uh, perfect there. Actually, we talked about this with uh, Darshak Patel about the, the barriers to office hours. And I've changed the terminology. I no longer call them office hours. They're discussion hours. Um, so I, I host discussion hours that are open to anybody that wants to jump on. And then I also have private um, discussion hours where somebody could schedule those. And for the students that show up to discussion hours, it's amazing how much you, I don't know if this was your experience, but for me, we would start off a discussion and then I would become, you know, uh, I'd move to the side and they would talk to each other and, and engage each other. Now there was things that I learned from them about um, online etiquette and um, how reluctant they might be to speak because you know in zoom there is a little bit of a delay sometimes and um you know they feel like they might be cutting each other off so when that happens they get really nervous and then they stop talking so as a facilitator i need to be able to say hey so and so you're about to say something you want to jump back in um so you just become a manager of the conversation and um the the, the community develops now, the, the issue that I had is out of 120 students in one of my classes, about only 20 of them would show up on, on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. um, so I left with the question of, did I manage to reach the other, you know, uh, 100 students? Uh, their grades indicate that, you know, they're learning and they're responsive and they're doing what they're doing. So maybe they didn't need discussion hours. So that gives them flexibility as well. Yeah, I, I got a little bit of that feedback. So I, I taught, again, a couple intro classes. So I think I only had like 55 or 60 students in that group. But I did small group discussions, you know, in class time. I had an instructional assistant and we would just kind of popped in and designated time when students were working on that long-term project where they, you know, they were required to meet with me in that, in that group. So like four or five students. And I asked them about the office hours thing, and some of them said, I, I do feel this semester like it's much easier to meet with faculty. And then, like you said, some of them said, I know I can, I haven't needed to, so. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. No, it, I'm, I'm very, you know, uh, I'm trying to evaluate, and I'm a big you know, believer in the power of reflection and sitting back and taking some time to 
figure out what worked, what didn't work. And I'm in that phase of the semester before I start going into the next semester. And the one thing that I am amazed by is how much connection um, there was in an online environment. And then one thing that I asked students to do was I made my reviews of the semester public. Like, tell people what you learned. And, and this is part of my efforts, and you do something uh, similar with respect to professional development. Uh, we have a lot of students that have LinkedIn accounts, but they have no idea how to use LinkedIn accounts. And, um, you know, I'm a big advocate in training and showing students the ways in which to use social media to build their professional brands. So I told them the best way to build a professional brand is to tell people what you learn and what you're doing. Uh, get, get them going on your journey uh, with you. So this past uh, week, I've just been getting all these tags from, from LinkedIn where they're expressing what they learn. And each student has a totally different um, point of what they learn. But, um, you know, leveraging that power of social media and connections in, in a virtual setting is really important. And this brings us back to, you know, your use of Instagram. And I am, I'll always say this, impressed. And um, your, your use of social media actually encourages me to try new things. So, you know, uh, I love following you on Instagram. What is the tip that you have for new instructors that First of all, why should they be on Instagram or any other social media platform? And then two, how to get started engaging your students in that environment? Yeah, I think that the tip I would say is, well, first of all, pick whatever platform works for you, as long as students are there, right? So you do have to be a little okay. bit mindful of, of where they tend to be, but also what you feel more comfortable with, right? So I am on Twitter. I rarely mm -hmm. use it. For me, the you know, the confrontational Twitter sphere just doesn't add good things to my life. So I try to use gotcha. it professionally, but I don't engage in that. That's just not my MO. I see the value, but it, it leads me to dark places, so I don't like it. But uh, for so for me, it's Instagram. It's, it's more visual, um, and that tends to be kind of how I socially network anyway. So that was the, a good location for me. Um, as far as uh, getting started, I think it's really you, you want to figure out for yourself, so whether you want to have a, a professional profile different from your personal profile. I think for a lot of instructors that haven't made the leap, that's a piece of it. You can absolutely do that, um, but still you want to be yourself. You know, it's, it's, it's somehow opening up again the, the while we have that intimacy in the face-to-face -face classroom, it, it is quite bounded. So it's about opening that up. Uh, and for me, it's about providing windows in and glimpses into all the other times that I'm thinking about what we're covering in the classroom or uh, my research or my professional work and sharing that with students. And so the way I try to do it, I, I've ex I experiment with different things and thank you for appreciating it. I also get lots of ideas from you. Um, you know, whether it's offering, you know, quizzes or questions or chances for students to interact, particularly um, when we went you know, kind of emergency transition online, students really appreciated that, like that you're thinking about them, you want to hear from them, even when they you couldn't see them, the students that you would run into on campus that weren't necessarily in your classes, it was just making space to say, this is what we're doing. Remember when we did this in class, do you, can you guess what this is? You know, it's simple stuff that just gives them that feedback. You know, I might take a picture of a, a graph and just say, what are we covering in class today? And it allows the students that have kind of moved on and they in other classes and I don't have them now to to kind of connect and give some feedback. So I guess it's about, you know, thinking about why why you're doing it. And so for me it was about opening up the conversation, showing students all the ways that I see economics in the world, showing students the various other work that I'm doing, things that I think are important and interesting. And also, like you said, some of those professional development type tips or, you know, study tips, online things. Um, for online learning. I think it's just another channel of communication. For me, it's an extension of the classroom. It's it's all the stuff I don't have time for in the classroom that I have to prioritize. And it tends to be, you know, the students who are curious about the topic um, or even are, you know, doing a little bit better in the class and can reach for a little bit more. It's a way to, to communicate with them. Another reason I think I like Instagram is you don't even have to join to look at what I'm doing. So a lot of students 
you know, because they're nervous. I, I never follow students back, but they don't know that, but they can just go to my page and take a look and they'll still talk to me about it in class, even if they're not technically like following me. Yeah. No, that's, uh, you know, social media has been a um, great way to develop community, like you said, not just with your current students, but previous students, because they will chime in. They're like, hey, I know what lecture you're talking about. Um, I remember this concept. Um, so, so yeah, that's, uh, that's the thing that I like about the use of, um, uh, I'm a big Twitter uh, person, but I realize that what you said is uh, accurate, that Twitter is more on the academic um, professional debate and my students don't have that um, th they're not involved with that uh, um, discussion so Instagram has been more about hey here's a picture or here's a graph here's an article or that you know I, I tried this thing out called econ minis which uh, I love doing them now I want to see how I could make my uh, you know uh, get my students to create these as reviews um, but there's so many ways to do it. Econ minis are like the little, um, the little uh, slideshows you've been doing of topics or whatever. It, exactly. I like those. Yes. Yeah. The, and, and, you know, I would love to find a way to uh, create a review session or have students create them as reviews rather than me creating them, have them do, you know, what is fiscal policy? And then you get to see how they express it in a visual uh, sense and um, also it helps them develop their external brand, right? Their portfolio of experiences. It made me think of, so for my senior seminar last year, I'll teach it again in the spring, um, the students do, uh, it's more of a literature review type of research, but some of the students who are going for honors um, will have to develop some sort of a audience targeted policy or otherwise recommendations. And some of the students did really great work again my idea was that they could then share it on linkedin or what have you but that same idea we boil it down to five slides so what would you give yeah. to a policymaker? what would you give to someone who's just passionate about the topic i'm thinking about targeting different levels of audience different levels of detail um yeah that was great only a few students did it last uh term but i think a few more will be encouraged to do so this time and, and it's also a valuable lesson for us as uh, researchers, educators, um, to figure out how many, you know, how to engage different audiences. Um, I think you read the book as well, Elevate the Debate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I learned from that book that, you know, just producing a research paper and letting it be out there to kind of gain its own traction is a is not a good way of uh, marketing your work. So the YouTube channel, the Instagram, these are all different points where you could tell uh, people the amazing things that you do. And I think it's also, you know, we're seeing it in the science community. I think we saw some of it, you know, post Great Recession. I didn't, I thought there was more of an opportunity for economics communication to become more of a focus. And that's a big piece of the way I'm trying to teach as well is how do you talk about these ideas? How do you convey them? And like you said, to not be having this, you know, very engaging, um, but echo chamber conversation among our other economists and no one even ever hears it who could do something meaningful with it. I think there's such a, a gap there. Uh, you're seeing a lot of, I think, uh, developing science communication as a specific, I guess, channel and i'd like to see more of that uh in econ i think encouraging our students to think that way that it's it's not about being able to talk the jargon so no one else can understand you it's about being yeah. able to have something meaningful to say or help other people understand what these meaningful outcomes are and i think all these different tools can be really helpful for that yeah communication is really important not just for our students but even policymakers. i mean we're seeing a lot of issues around the world uh and you work internationally as well um where the problems that we're facing are really not economic problems they're communication of economics problems um so you do uh you know a, a great thing with uh, audio econ uh i'm a subscriber of the newsletter and i love receiving uh, the updates can you give me a background on how this idea of audio econ started and what is it today sure so audio econ it's uh, uh, been around almost 10 years i think it started because, you know, again, when I'm teaching, again, this was majority at the intro level because of the diversity of topics. Um, I'm looking for ways to help students to practice applying that economic lens, right? So you're reading a textbook and there's specific examples. Um, 
I was looking for a little bit more distance. So things that are happening in the world and students having to use their developing economics understanding to apply to this issue, whatever it is. So it originally started with Planet Money. That was kind of the big first uh, econ podcast. And I really liked how they would talk about something that was happening, whether it was in the you know area of some corporations or policy or just day-to-day -day life or curiosities. And it wasn't articulated specifically necessarily like these are the concepts of economics that help us to understand this. But by having the conversation and exploring those ideas, you could see that knowing under uh, economics helped you to understand the question or to formulate a question or to understand what was underlying this unusual thing that was happening. So I was really excited about that and I started bringing it into my uh, introductory classes. Initially students were just kind of listening to them periodically. Over time it's gotten more uh, specific, but as I was trying to make it a little bit more integrated into the uh, class content, I was developing and identifying the specific podcasts that I thought the students would really get a lot from around particularly the more topics that are more difficult to get the application of. And then as I was doing that, I thought, well, I'm not the only one who's trying to solve this problem. So how can I communicate this to other instructors? So it just became a space where I can share all these interesting podcasts. Now it's a huge array of various podcasts, mostly, you know, econ targeted, but not all. And then I try to provide how you can use it as an instructor. So there's the concepts that I found useful. Sometimes I provide discussion questions or writing prompts or you know various ways to kind of ease you into it if this is something that you'd like to bring into your classroom. So at this point, um, again, it's about 10 years old now. There's, uh, I think I have usually around 1,500, 1,700 users each year all across uh, uh, 120 plus countries, I think. Um, so people are both using it just to think about econ if it's not their, they're not instructors and they're not students, they just maybe are curious about it. But also a number of instructors reach out to me regularly that they are using it, whether it's to have students listen or now increasingly, as I was mentioning, I have students make podcasts as well, kind of in the image of a Planet Money. And if you go to Audio Econ, you can check out the top four best ones from this semester right now. Yeah, I got I got that email. Was it this morning or yesterday that uh, that they're up and it's on my to do list to to listen to them. So, um, so, so great resource if uh, you're an economic instructor that wants to utilize podcasts and don't want to go out finding all your uh, own podcasts or investing in that uh, costly aspect. Audio Econ, sign up. You get the newsletter with updates, and you could add them to your learning management system and use the prompts um, to, to engage your students. So thank you for, for doing that uh, hard work for all of us. I appreciate it. <laughs> the, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, first of all, you, you wrote papers with respect to the use of podcasts, correct? Yeah, so um, there's two in the Journal of Economics Education, one covering the introduction of audio econs, I think that was like 2013, 2014, and then another with, with the idea of how to have your students create podcasts. I think that's called pod learning if you want to check that one out. They're also okay. linked through audio econ, so you can check them out there. But yeah, so again, the idea of explaining the uh, rationale behind the pedagogical tools, giving uh, specific in, you know, guidelines and frameworks and things that you can use and adapt to yourself, uh, that's what you can find in the publications. Perfect. I'll make sure to link those to the show notes as well so others could uh, uh, use them uh, for, for their podcasts. Uh, before we leave today, I have uh, a question about your international experience. So uh, a couple of years, I think, at this point now, time flies. Um, you, you had international experience. I followed it once again on Instagram and, and social media. Um, but I never knew how did you how did this international experience come about? And, um, you know, what are the connections now? Sure. Yeah. So um, I am just a person. I, I like to travel. Um, I think it's with all the reasons that we tell our students to do it, and also just as a human being to develop empathy and really understand how context informs your way of being in the world. Um, I've always enjoyed travel, so um, since I was you know, undergrad, I always wanted to apply for a Fulbright, which is the US State Department sponsored 
program which sends both students and then also uh, I went on the scholars program where you um, get the opportunity to research or teach or both um, in a country where uh, the State Department has a, has partnered with uh, the, the local consulate or whatever the um, you know US position is there to identify a need and they you know target scholars to go in that area so you you identify a country that where they have uh, a need that you'd like to go um, and I uh, identified wanting to go to uh, Rwanda and, and Central Africa and you reach out to a institution so I found the University of Kigali which is a, a growing young institution they have about 8,000 students um, I taught there in their graduate program so I was teaching MBA students economics but I also had the opportunity to um, help them develop new uh, curricular programs and do review of that. Um, I did a lot of faculty training both while I was there and since I've been back, since we all, the magic of Zoom means that all these international connections become much easier to maintain, I think, and to provide trainings and, and help that way has been really terrific. Uh, also, while I was there, I worked with the um, Rwandan National Higher Education Council, so they uh, a colleague of mine at University of Kigali was helping them to prepare uh, colleges and universities that were applying for accreditation. And so they asked me to serve on this team to help one of the institutions there to develop their uh, materials for that. So all kinds of really interesting opportunities. Uh, Fulbright's terrific just this past week. Through Fulbright, I was asked to give a guest lecture for uh, Uzbekistan, which was really interesting as well. That just came through a Fulbright colleague. So yeah, so I spent a year there. I've also done other teaching. I did a study abroad class in uh, Greece and Cyprus. And then a few years ago, it was 2016, I got a fellowship to do some research in South Africa, which was is really interesting. It's kind of more regional, but if you're in the New England area, check out the Marion and Jasper Whiting Foundation. Uh, they give a fellowship for instructors to go and do research intended to bring back to the classroom. So at the time I was developing the urban economics class and I went uh, both to Johannesburg and Cape Town looking at economic policies around water issues. And that's a, a really big part of my urban economics class and the environmental economics class as well. Wow, that's a really valuable experience to bring back to, to the classroom. Um, I'm sure the students love all those examples. It's, it's very fun to do. I would encourage people. I have um, contributed to a book that's coming out that uh, Kim Holder and Josh Hall are editing about study abroad, but my piece is that it's for instructors as well. It can be great professional development in terms of I had all those uh, opportunities for curriculum review and development. Uh, you get to experiment with your uh, pedagogical tools. Does it work in a different context, both culturally you know, and academically and structurally? Um, and also then to have all those experiences to bring back to the classroom because that students really perk up when you are speaking from a position of experience. I mean, I know you were not um, not teaching, I don't think, but you were in uh, Ireland and that I know all, all went a bit around. Yeah. So uh, how was your experience <laughs> with that? So, you know, I, I have a colleague right now that's actually looking to consider a possible year abroad in the thing that I experienced is um, it's difficult to develop those connections. It's you know it's not part of our professional development or training on how to um, you know leave the country and go work somewhere else or get some experience. Uh, luckily, I had a sabbatical um, and through networks, um, I was able to get a position, a research position at uh, um, University College of Dublin, and it. Yes, I mean, COVID happened March, it kind of threw a wrench and everything, but it was probably the one of the best things in my career that I've done. I found like, and this is advice that you actually gave me before I went out on sabbatical, you told me to document everything because you're gonna forget what you, what you do throughout the year. And I was like, that's impossible, how could, but it moves fast. And there's so many experiences that happen when you're not tied to the 16 week uh, semester, invitations to, to go present other places. Um, so I, I think I grew individually because I was able to once again reflect and see where I wanted my career to go next. 
but the power of networks. I mean, developing uh, relationships with our colleagues at CTAIL, at UCL, um, you know, in, in Dublin. And I've got to present at the Spanish Economic Association meetings, which would have never happened if I was <laughs> stateside. Um, so that's one of my nudges for um, people that have a sabbatical or have the ability come, you know, to find a way to get away for a year and kind of grow from it, do it. It sounds like it's costly or time consuming or a big change, but that's exactly what you need. I think so too. And I, I think um, the reflecting is really important too, because like you said, time moves so fast. You, you spend so much time getting oriented to a different place. And even if you're not going somewhere else, you, you set certain goals for yourself for your sabbatical or your, or your period off. I think actually writing them down and then reflecting on them maybe at the midpoint and at the end, because you do want to keep a record of all the things you've done, but also it serves as an anchor. Like you started this for a specific reason, remembering what those reasons are, adjusting the reasons as you have new information, but then being able to, again, go back and reflect. I think it's, I think being intentional about it, whether you're going to try to apply for Fulbright, which I very much encourage people who are eligible to do so, that takes time and there's lots of other opportunities as well. So setting that intention from the beginning kind of serves as a, mm -hmm. a guidepost to go the whole way through. But even if it's just for your own accountability, the experience of looking back when I had finished my time in Rwanda at my goals and actually writing a reflection was, it was really powerful because you you get lost in kind of the day-to-day the -day of it or the, like the, you know, the big experience you get to have, but, but how much you change as a person, I think it's really important to sit down with yourself and think about it. Yeah. And, you know, I, I had written down goals before I left. Um, I reevaluated them halfway through. And then looking back, uh, when I got back to Northern Kentucky University, we were required to, to do things, uh, to, to do two things, to submit a report on what we actually accomplished and then uh, in the spring semester, I'm supposed to present to the uh, university community on my year um, away. And what I realized is I had my list of to-dos and there's things that I didn't meet, right? But there was a whole list of things that are now as part of this accomplishment list that were not initially on the initial list. So, um, and at first I was like, whoa, I didn't meet these two requirements that I you know, had set out. But look at this entire list of things that I've done uh, in addition. So it makes you feel a bit better about uh, what you've done. Yeah, and I think go, being open, like you said, you, you, you have to start with a set of goals, but being other, open to other opportunities because you never know, especially if you're in a new place, you may have a skill set that you don't even necessarily identify as a skill set. But in this new yeah. place, it's, it's valuable to the people who are there. And uh, parts of what you do every day might be uh, something that you can meaningfully contribute in a new setting so yeah the the one thing that um the whole experience with covid um has taught me is i had uh back uh filled my plans in dublin so uh, my goal was april may and june to enjoy it and you know go travel around ireland well that didn't happen <laughs> you know there's nothing i could have done about that but in hindsight um, you know, build those personal, um, you know, checkpoints or excursions, whatever you want to call them. Personal time is part of this, uh, this year, um, away. So take advantage of that. Learn from me. <laughs> yeah. Balance a little bit di differently. Yeah. I think that's a yeah. good tip. You couldn't have known, but it's a lesson I, you probably never forget. That is true. I will never forget that lesson. I was going to say, Sorry. there's also research opportunities that come from it. I don't know if you had any like new partnerships and things. So you never know who you're going to meet. So, so yeah. So for me, what um, ended up happening is um, I was in Oman to give a presentation um, to, to policymakers there. And that's when airports shut down. And, um, you know, it was impossible to, to leave. Um, but I was able to develop connections in Oman at a rate that would have never happened um, being outside of Oman. Oman is a very, I don't know how familiar you are with the, with the culture and the community, but it's actually similar to the uh, Irish um, uh, culture where, you know, you have to be in the presence of people to really experience um, everything that they have to offer and to be uh, pulled into, into the culture. Um, and once you're there, it's impossible to, to get out, get out of it. Um, so being in Oman allowed me to, 
uh, you know, get to know people there. That wasn't part of my list of things uh, that I wanted to accomplish, but build new new connections. And you know, this YouTube channel um, also came out of that. <laughs> That's it, it was a good experience, uh, yeah. all in all. I'm ready for life to get back to normal, though. I think I know, everybody whatever, is. Whatever that's going to be, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever that's, yeah. yeah. Um, well, Rebecca, I really appreciate you being part of uh, this conversation. Uh, you have a, a valuable um, experience in, in the profession and non-traditional path that uh, I think will be beneficial for people that are trying to define how they could contribute to the economics profession. So thank you for telling us your story, and um, thank you for being here today. Excellent. Thank you for opening up this space to talk about these different sets of questions that we normally get to think about. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that.